Summer's almost over. The hottest movies of the year are here. Let's talk about it. Kicking off with probably the only movie a lot of people see in theaters this year, Deadpool and Wolverine. Spoilers ahead. So in order to get every joke, you either gotta watch a new Rockstars video or know the ins and outs of the last 30 years of Marvel movies. Even ones that were never made. You know how long I've been waiting for this? Woo, I'm about to make a name for myself here. I don't think you guys walk away from this. You just make sure people know what happened here today. Ryan Reynolds and the writing team crafted this for us millennials from the funny yet cringy use of InSync to Deadpool and Wolverine's never-ending game of gay chicken. Trust me, as I started to cheer for Wesley Snipes' Blade return, I noticed the teenager next to me couldn't give two shits about the old man on screen, but you know, fuck them kids. The story is a little convoluted with alternate timeline jargon, but this has the same level of seriousness as a Mel Brooks style spoof movie, and I couldn't tell you the plots to those either. Pardon me sir, I have an idea. Corporal, get me the video cassette of Spaceballs the movie. Yes sir. Producers 12. Colonel Sanders, may I speak with you please? Yes sir. How can there be a cassette of Spaceballs the movie? We're still in the middle of making it. Instead, it's about what's funny in the moment and stringing together these sketch-like scenes. They do try to add some pathos with Wade and Vanessa's relationship, but the emotional core of this film is the audience's relationship to the now-defunct Fox universe. One nitpick is while Hugh Jackman does still look insanely jacked, man, this version of Wolverine is an alcoholic who's given up on the world, so he's kind of quietly moping in the background for a good chunk of the movie. Thankfully, the screenwriters give us this quiet moment between him and Daphne Keene that dissolves his fogginess. Let's fucking go! Let's fucking go. I think one other little thing that hurt this movie was not having either version of Charles Xavier, yet making his evil twin Cassandra Nova the villain. Sean Levy, the director, said on the Happy Sad Confused podcast that he never even discussed having Patrick Stewart or James McAvoy, which just seems illogical to me, but hey, I didn't make a billion dollar movie, so what do I know? Standouts were Channing Tatum's unintelligible gambit, plus all the comic book accurate Wolverines. Considering this was made before, during, and after the 2023 writer strike, it's a miracle it came together as well as it did. If you are even a casual Marvel fan, this has to be one of, if not the funniest Marvel movie with no dull moments. Oh, fuck off! Osgood Perkins, son of Anthony Perkins, who plays psycho killer Norman Bates, follows in his father's footsteps by making a big splash in the world of horror. It's better to go in knowing as little as possible, so again, spoiler warning. In an interview with the Big Picture Podcast, Perkins mentions imitating the silence of the lambs as both star female FBI agents hunting down a serial killer, but that's pretty much where the similarities end. Nick Cage gives another fantastically over-the-top performance, which works, but I feel like it would have been even creepier with an unknown actor that maybe could sing like an 80s glam rocker. Denny might turn some people off because they go full Annabelle by introducing an evil doll that has been pulling the strings all along. Or maybe the doll is just a conduit vehicle for the devil to get inside the home and then either possess or influence the father into killing the family. I'm not really sure what happened there, I'd have to see it again. Either way, the reveal renders the Zodiac style codes that Longlegs had been leaving behind as pointless because, as Perkins says, I don't give a fuck about triangles, dates, and clues and shit. Personally, I enjoy code breaking in movies, but it was a refreshing take to show that serial killers are just gross losers and not as smart as some true crime podcasts would have you believe. That said, leaning so heavily on a grounded procedural for the majority of the movie and then pulling the rug out from the viewer to introduce demonic entities in the third act just leaves some unanswered questions. It seems like Perkins is saying, on one hand serial killers are just guys getting off on killing, but also the devil is real and makes good men do bad things. The message is muddy. The tone and cinematography are what set this movie apart, but it might be a case of style over substance. Longlegs is a great example of having an idea that, in the wrong studio's hands, might have gotten sucked into a pre-existing IP just to use the name recognition. In a darker timeline, this might have become a new Silence of the Lambs Lega sequel, or pulled into the Conjuring universe, but instead, thankfully, Neon made something new if only a little rough around the edges. Twisters is for the simpler movie fan. If you don't care for superheroes or half loot and thinkers like Kinds of Kindness, this one's for you. It's a throwback disaster movie that fits right into the vibe of its 90s predecessor, although technically this isn't a sequel. Glenn Powell cements his status as the 2020's hot new movie star and sort of steals the show from the movie's lead, Katie, played by Daisy Edgar Jones. It's a classic underdog story between the wealthy capitalists and the altruistic scientists. 
Anthony Ramos probably has the meatiest role as a friend who started with Katie, then let the money of David Cornsweet's team corrupt him until he has a moment to do the right thing for Katie. You know, character development. It's nice to see once in a while. The twisters look sick, and the sponsored cocktail of twisted tea, vodka, and peach from AMC was even sicker. So this is definitely one to rent on the weekend with some drinks. Oh, M Night Shyamalan, here we go again. Ever since the first trailer dropped, I was pretty excited for this Josh Hartnett-led thriller. Hartnett was just making a comeback with standout performances in Black Mirror and Oppenheimer last summer, and while he's not the problem with Trap, there are a couple problems. The first half is what the trailer showcases, the big concert that Hartnett takes his daughter to which is portrayed as like a Beyonce or Taylor Swift type of show. Everything that happens here is pretty good. The tension builds, Hartnett finding tools and disguises during the concert are fun, suspenseful scenes, but even here you can start to see cracks in the screenplay. This is a Shyamalan hallmark, but characters speak like NPCs giving side quests, and information is conveniently dished out, but like Deadpool and Wolverine, I don't think Trap is meant to be taken too seriously. Hartnett is able to get into restricted places a little too easily, there are thousands of cops everywhere making this a pretty obvious sting, and the only glimpse into his life as a serial killer is one phone video of a person who's still alive and chained up in his basement. The third act doesn't have a big twist, and this is also where it slows down because now not only do you lose the unique and exciting concert venue setting, but M. Night also basically pivots to a new protagonist. The ending relies on Salika Shyamalan to become a stereotypical final girl that has to outsmart the killer, and nepotism aside, Salika just had too much blood on her shoulders and maybe not enough acting experience. However, this is a father-daughter story that, on a meta level, Shyamalan made as a father-daughter bonding experience with Salika, and I just can't hate him for that. I thought she did okay, but my audience was unfortunately laughing at some of her serious line deliveries. It is a very funny movie, especially for Shyamalan, but there are just as many moments that were meant to be serious where my theater was whispering behind me, that is so stupid. Also, I'm just a Kid Cudi fan, so anytime I see him pop up, especially wearing a long ridiculous wig, I'm a happy boy. So based on modern audience etiquette and a slightly disappointing ending, I'd have to say wait for streaming on this one. Enjoy the rest of the concert. Speaking of streaming, this next one is already available on Hulu in the States, in case you missed it in theaters. If you made it this far, you're a real one. Ape Together Strong. The best thing I can say about these movies is just how phenomenal the apes all look. There are times where it looks like a photoreal ape while having the most subtle micro expressions that only a human could form. Not to mention the scenes with apes in water and wet hair. All of that is CGI. The performances by Kevin Durand as Proximus, Owen Teague as Noah, and Peter McCone as Raka were all excellent and they were perfectly cast. Set generations after the death of Caesar, humans now have started to lose communication skills and look closer to cavemen than businessmen, while religious zealots have twisted Caesar's words into a dictator's manifesto. The ending is somewhat predictable, but this still has some interesting ideas, like seeing what happens when a historical figure's words are twisted into a creed for zealots, versus when a true devout follower keeps the good morals of said figure. The obvious interpretation being Christianity and how the words of Jesus can be used to put down marginalized groups. Still I'm amazed by the fact that these themes are in a movie about talking monkeys. It's a very unique style of sci-fi that has always been a low-key way of showing a dystopian future. And there's probably a cool name for this genre of future overrun by nature, like jungle punk or something. But I love it. Listen to how VFX supervisor Eric Winquist and his team developed this aesthetic. We don't have reference for what a skyscraper would look like in yeah. 150 years or 200 years, whatever, from now. Because a lot of these materials, they haven't yeah. been around for 200 years. Part of our process on this was kind of going through the closest thing we could find. Oh, here was an old mining facility that's been sitting and left to, to rot. Here's an old shopping mall in Thailand that's been like rapidly getting pulled back into the forest again. I love that these eight movies are just weird enough to still be popcorn flicks with a little flavor. Anyway, it's hot as hell here in Los Angeles, so I'm gonna head to the movie theater to get some air conditioning. Thanks for watching and joining me at the helm.